Diverse in form and function, ants have established themselves as one of the most successful groups on the planet. Well equipped to take on anything that stands opposed to their empire, and conquering nearly every terrestrial ecosystem in their quest for power and territory. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the family Formicidae, better known as the ants. Now, this family is within the order Hymenoptera, so if you're looking for a broader perspective, feel free to click the link above. So this is the first family level video I've done on this channel. And despite their lower taxonomic level, there is no shortage of information on these guys. People will form whole careers around ants, and they're very well studied because of their unique social structure and incredible resourcefulness. And boy are they resourceful. Ants have been around for over 100 million years, and they've diversified into over 12,000 different species, and I'm sure there's many more to be discovered. Not to mention, they've conquered nearly every piece of land that isn't one of the polar regions. And it isn't just their diversity that's impressive. In terms of abundance, there are believed to be 10,000 trillion different ants on Earth at any given moment. And in some areas, they're believed to comprise a fifth to a quarter of all terrestrial animal biomass. Now, granted, these large estimates always have to take some liberties, but let's just say there's a lot of them. Despite their diversity, there are still some traits you can use to distinguish ants from other insect groups. I cover some Hymenoptera morphology in the ordinal level video, but let's dive a little deeper into the Hymenopteran body plan, because it's a little unintuitive. Insects have three major body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And when you look at the Hymenopteran body plan, you seem to see a head, a thorax, and a big ol' abdomen connected by a small waist. Seems simple enough. However, the division between thorax and abdomen is a little bit fuzzy. The first abdominal segment, the propodium, is actually fused to the thorax. And then the second abdominal segment, the petiole, is that small little waist you see. The rest of the abdomen we call the gaster, and that's the part that actually looks like an abdomen. To further confuse things, some ants will have a two-segment petiole, in which the second segment is called the postpetiole. So since we can't just refer to that whole middle section as the thorax, entomologists will use different terminology, sometimes referring to it as the allotrunk. Or if you want the easier way, instead of using head, thorax, abdomen, for the hymenopterans, you can refer to it as the prosoma, the mesosoma, and the metasoma, which really just translates to front part, middle part, back part. But ISP, how do we distinguish an ant from say, a wasp then? Yes, so that body plan discussion will get you to Hymenoptera for sure. But within the Hymenoptera, it can get a little tricky. Most of the ants you're going to come across are going to be those wingless workers. And most wasps are going to have wings. But there are wingless wasps. And ants do produce alate or winged individuals. So the best tell is going to be the antennae. Ants have geniculate or elbowed antennae while wasps are going to have more straight or even curled antennae. Now, there are some wasps with bent antennae, so keep the wing thing in mind as well. One other characteristic you can use that I failed to mention is the petiole. For the most part, wasps are going to have a relatively smooth petiole, and ants' petioles are going to have some sort of lump or spike. Now, there are gray areas, but it's just another tool in the toolkit. Okay, unpause. But like the other Hymenoptera, the ants are holometabolous, going from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. All ants are eusocial, except for a couple social parasites that we can discuss later. Now, eusociality means that they have cooperative care of young, an overlap of generations living together, and only some adults reproduce. Because of this eusocial structure, let's talk about the life cycle of a colony rather than just the life cycle of an individual. Now, keep in mind that colony life cycle can look very different across groups, but we can still give a broad framework that most groups abide by. It all starts with a freshly mated queen ant. Now, most people think of queens as just egg-laying machines, but it's her responsibility to get this colony started from ground zero. 
So to start out, she creates a small chamber and seals herself within it. She also removes her wings, as she will not be leaving the colony from this point forward. Since there are no workers yet, the queen must raise the first brood herself. She uses her own unfertilized eggs as food, called trophic eggs. She chews these up and feeds them to the larvae through trophallaxis, an exchange of fluids, like a baby bird. Because of the limited nutrition, the first batch of brood is a little bit smaller. We refer to these as nanitics. Nanitics get the colony moving. They start foraging for food, expand and clean the shelter, and tend to brood. Eventually, they'll be replaced with larger workers, and the colony can grow from there. Once the colony reaches a suitable size, it'll begin creating alate males and new queens called princess ants. These princess ants have the same genetics as workers, but are created through different nutrition or chemical cues. Males, on the other hand, come from unfertilized eggs, carrying only one set of chromosomes in a process called haplodiploidy. Social bees and wasps do this too. Unfertilized haploid eggs create males, while fertilized diploid eggs create females. Once they emerge from their pupae and their exoskeletons have a chance to harden, these ants leave the nest and begin their nuptial flight to seek out mates from another colony. Queens will mate with multiple males on this flight, and stores the sperm in a specialized structure called a spermatheca. This will provide all of the reproductive material she needs for the entire colony life cycle. She will never mate again. So fully armed, she goes off to start a new colony. The males, satisfied with fulfilling their life purpose, kick the bucket. Even just going over this broad framework, I hope I gave you a sense of just how complex these colony life cycles really are. But you're not getting off that easy. Let's talk briefly about some absurd ants and how they make their living. I don't have time to go over all of them, of course, and I'm gonna miss some, so please leave your favorites in the comments. Leafcutter ants are a personal favorite of mine because they're part of the select group of animals that practice agriculture, carrying away snippets of leaves to feed their growing crop of fungus. And this fungus primarily feeds their larvae, being very rich in protein. Ants can also be found keeping cattle, sort of. Aphids and their relatives excrete a sugary substance called honeydew. And this honeydew is very tasty to ants. So ants will tend to and protect these groups of aphids to harvest their honeydew. Some ants will cut out the middleman and use their own workers as sugar factories. Honeypot ants have workers that are specialized to store large amounts of food in their abdomens and they can then extract this food through trophallaxis. Now, this is more of a case of food storage than cattle rearing. A similar yet more gruesome example of this can be found in the Dracula ants, which will periodically suck the hemolymph, the insect equivalent of blood, from their own larvae. Isn't nature beautiful? And speaking of more gruesome practices, I can't move on without mentioning the slaver ants. Yes, they're exactly what they sound like. These are social parasites. They steal the brood from other groups and raise them to increase their own workforce. And this behavior has evolved multiple times across the Formicidae. Diving ants do their own raids, but rather than raiding other ant colonies, they raid carnivorous pitcher plants, stealing prey straight from the digestive juices. Now, oddly enough, this seems to be mutualistic as they're only taking out larger insects, which would likely reach high levels of decay before digesting and could negatively impact the plant. Other ants will form plant mutualisms as well, such as the acacia ants. The acacia plants will create these hollow structures to house the ants called domatia. And in turn, the ants will attack any herbivores that dare approach the acacia's foliage. Other plants will provide nectaries or food bodies to attract their own ant bodyguards. But even if the plant doesn't provide a house for them, ants will sometimes make their own. Weaver ants glue together leaves using silk produced by their larvae, creating cozy little abodes high up in the canopy far away from most predators. But it isn't just their colony structure or feeding behaviors that make them so complex. Ants have developed a variety of defenses to protect themselves from invasion. Trapjaw ants can snap their jaws closed at speeds of up to 140 miles an hour, plenty enough force to launch themselves high up into the air. The only species who has it beat is the Dracula ant, Maestrium camelae, 
who can snap its jaws at 200 miles an hour, the fastest moving appendage in the animal kingdom. But it isn't always the mandibles you have to worry about. Often it's the sting. The bullet ant is one of only three species to rank a 4 out of 4 on the Schmidt Sting Pain Index, which includes over 78 different species of stinging insect. Other ants will utilize chemical warfare. Formica and Chromatogaster ants are great examples of the many ants that utilize formic acid as a chemical weapon. Most ants will spray or smear their chemical defenses. Other ants are more dramatic. Some species from the genus Colobopsis will explode parts of their body to coat their enemies in a glue-like substance, aptly named the exploding ants. And this sacrifice for the good of the colony is called autothysis. It isn't all about offense, though. Some ants have found unique ways to seal up their entrances to prevent invasion. Turtle ants have specialized soldiers with large flatheads that are perfect for sealing up entrances. But what exactly are these ants defending against, you might ask? Sure, they have predators, other arthropods, reptiles and amphibians, birds like the ant pittas, large mammals like the aardvark. Just the aardvark. Nothing else of note there. Ants also have fungal pathogens and other diseases to deal with. Living in close quarters with millions of members means that disease can spread very fast if precautions are not taken. Because of this, ants are known to administer antimicrobial chemicals, social distance from high-risk individuals, and quickly dispose of their dead in makeshift cemeteries, a behavior known as necrophoresis. But one of the biggest threats to ant colonies is other ant colonies. You see, ants like to participate in a little human pastime we call warfare. Many ants are generalists, and they consequently have a lot of overlap in terms of what they like to eat. So other nearby ant colonies can be a source of serious competition, stealing away resources like seeds and fruit and other insects. Not to mention that other ant colonies themselves are a great food resource, filled with tasty brood that's ripe for the taking. Because of this, ants don't take kindly to their neighbors, and war is a very regular part of the ant lifestyle, both between species and within the same species. Might be for the best though, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and I for one would be terrified to start seeing peace treaties forming between ant colonies. Though this is kind of already happening. Humans are really good at accidentally moving species into places they shouldn't be, and some ant species get along pretty well with closely related colonies. Enter the founder effect. The founder effect occurs when a small group of individuals is introduced into a new area where it can proliferate rapidly. The resulting population has very similar genetics as it came from a pretty small genetic founding. Sometimes this is detrimental and can lead to inbreeding depression. In the case of some ant colonies, it resulted in super colonies. When ants such as the Argentine ant and red imported fire ant were introduced into new areas, they proliferated rapidly, and the resulting colonies got along pretty well with each other due to the lower genetic diversity. This created mass super colonies that spanned entire regions. As you might have guessed, this can cause problems for us and the surrounding environment. Invasive ants have been a headache to deal with and there are plenty to choose from. In addition to feeding on seeds and saplings on our agricultural plots, red imported fire ants tend to aphids and other crop pests, bolstering their populations. Not to mention they deliver a nasty sting to anyone who wanders too close to their nest. The aforementioned Argentine ants are a nuisance in homes and a big agricultural pest for similar reasons. Their sheer numbers also overwhelm many native species, especially our native ants. Plenty of other invasive ants are causing issues for our native ones, such as the Asian needle ants and the longhorned crazy ant. This is an issue because native ants are often a cornerstone of their environments, performing critical services such as soil aeration, seed dispersal, nutrient cycling, herbivore control, and ecosystem engineering, creating and altering the physical structure of their environments. Because of this, it's important we keep our native ant populations healthy, and there's a few ways you can do this. When treating for invasive ants, try to use more of a spot treatment approach rather than broad application of insecticide. Another thing to consider is that a lot of these invasive species thrive in disturbed environments, 
That's why they're able to so successfully establish themselves in the first place. However, many of these native species don't share that same sentiment. So by keeping some of your land wild through natural landscaping and native plants, you can help increase ant diversity on your property and at the very least give the invasive ants some competition. There's a war going on all around us, so just make sure you're on the right side of the battle line. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future orders. This was a long one, so I appreciate you sticking around, and I'm sure there's a lot I missed. So if you have any other fun ant facts, or just any species you have a particular fondness for, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear about them. Peace, y'all.